Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, now we are going to start with uh, with thermodynamics, and under this thermodynamics, we are going to look at the following items: production definition terms used in chemical thermodynamics, internal energy, laws of thermodynamics, and then we are also going to look at uh, the difference between first law and the second law of thermodynamics, free energy or gives free energy. The energy crisis in nature conclusion and the reference. So now we are starting with uh, thermodynamics. The word thermodynamics means study of flow of heat. Thermo means heat. Dynamics means movement. So the flow of heat, the study of flow of heat is what you call thermodynamics. Now, for example, now, as I said, the word thermodynamics is made up of two words, thermo and dynamics. The thermo means heat. Whenever we say thermo, it means heat. Then dynamics means flow or movement. So the study of movement of heat or the study of change of heat or the study of flow of heat all means thermodynamics. Then another definition that uh, thermodynamics is a branch of physical chemistry which deals with the study of energy changes accompanying a chemical reaction. Of course, if you have a reaction, let's say you have A, you have A plus B to produce A plus B to produce C and D. So along the process, there is an energy change. So these energy changes that happened during the course of the chemical reaction is actually what you call the thermodynamics. So there is, an, there is usually an energy changes that accompany or that lead to the change of reactant products. So that change of energy that happened during the course of chemical reaction is what you call thermodynamics. That is the meaning of thermodynamics, okay? The simple term, when we say thermodynamics, thermo means heat. Dynamics means flow of heat or change of heat. So the study of change of heat that happen or the study of change of energy that happen during the chemical reaction is what you call thermodynamics. So now we are going to look at some terms used in thermodynamics and we have to understand them very well. We have systems surrounding and also have types of system, often system, closed system and isolated system. So we are starting with the system. What is a system? A system is a region. A re system is a region where processes take place. It's a region where processes take place. Like for example, we can consider a class as a system because in a class, there is a process that are taking place. Like for example, the respiration, we are taking in oxygen and carbon dioxide as we are in the class. And also another process that is taking place, the teaching and learning process, the teaching and learning. So any region or any space where processes are taking place is what you call surrounding. Sorry, it's what you call system. Process steps, sorry, a region or a place where processes are taking place is called a system. If you are in your room, you are cooking, so you can consider your room as a system because the cooking is also a process and that's a boundary. So anything outside that system is considered as a surroundings. For example, now, if you consider your class as a system, so it means that whatever is outside that class is considered as a surrounding. The university, the Zaria itself, the Nigeria itself, the other countries, other continent of the world, are all considered as a surrounding. So if you can, you can actually, like for example, this is a cup. You can consider this cup, you can consider this cup as a system. So anything outside this cup, anything outside this cup is surrounding. 
So therefore, between the system and the surrounding, there is a boundary. Between the system and the surround, between the system and the surrounding, there is a boundary. So therefore, if you have a system, system plus surrounding will give you universe, will give you universe. So system from plus surrounding will give universe. So therefore, anything outside the system is called surroundings. And between the system and the surrounding, there is a boundary. So when you add surroundings plus system, you have a universe. So anything, 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 anything outside the system is considered as, as a surrounding. So therefore, if you now consider the pots that you are cooking your foods as a system, so it means that anything outside that uh, pot is considered as a surrounding. So if you have surrounding plus system, you have universe. And then we have types of system. We have an orphan system, we have closed system, and we have isolated system. So an orphan system is a type of system where there is an exchange of energy. There is an exchange of energy and matter. M stands for matter, while E stands for energy. So orphan system is a system where there is an exchange of matter and energy between the system and the surrounding. It means that energy and matter are exchanging between the system and the surrounding. That is what you call an open system. Then we have a closed system. A closed system, in the case of closed system, there is, an, there is only exchange of energy, but there is no exchange of matter. Matter is not exchanging in the case of closed system, but there is an exchange of energy. Then we have isolated system. So in the case of isolated system, there is no exchange, there is no exchange of matter and energy between the system and the surrounding. So both matter and energy are not exchanging between the system and the surrounding. So now let's just ask this question. Which types of system is our universe operating? Because we are living on Earth and Earth is considered as the universe. So which types of system are we operating? Or which type of system is the universe operating? Actually, the universe is operating an open system. That is why we even survive. That is why we survive on Earth. Because remember, the energy we are getting is solar energy and is coming directly from the sun. And the sun is outside the universe. So therefore, if we can take our Earth, if you can, we can take up our Earth, that is our universe as a system. So anything outside the earth, anything outside the earth can be considered as the surroundings. So it's because there is an exchange of matter and energy between outside the universe into the universe or between the universe and outside the universe. You remember, even the sun, the moon are coming directed, are, 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 are located outside the universe. So you can consider you know, the universe itself as a surrounding, sorry, as a system, and anything outside our universe, we can consider it as a surrounding. So it's because there is an exchange between our universe and outside the universe, that is why we are surviving. Because some of the carbon dioxide we are getting is coming from there. The energy, which is the solar energy we are getting is also from there. So our art is operating under often system, that is why we survive. Okay, now we are also going to look at the physical properties of the system. So every system has its own physical properties. Number one, we have intensive properties. What is intensive properties? Intensive properties are the properties that depend on mass. So it depends on mass. So these intensive properties, we have temperature, fragile, viscosity, surface tension, refractive index, specific heat, density, etc. 
while for the extensive properties we have mass we have mass volume energy heat capacity entropy gives free energy etc and then also we have thermodynamic process and we are going to look at this thermodynamic process one after the other we have isothermal process isothermal process is a process that happened when the temperature is constant is constant we also have a diabetic process isobaric isochoric reversible process and irreversible process so we are going to look at these properties one after the other Okay, now we are going to talk about internal energy. So generally, ladies and gentlemen, every substance, every substance, every substance possesses a defined amount of energy, which defend often it is chemical nature, temperature, pressure, and volume. So any substance we know, any substance we know, it has a specific amount of energy it has. And that amount of energy depend on the nature the temperature, pressure, and the volume of that particular substances. And that energy is called internal energy. It's called internal energy. And the total internal energy is calculated as this, or you can actually get a formula for an inter for change in internal energy. So the change in internal energy is equal to final internal energy minus initial internal energy. That is before the change of one, after the energy, after the change of hope. So we can actually get the change of internal energy. So now we are going to talk about the laws of thermodynamics. So the laws of thermodynamics, we are starting with the first law of thermodynamics. So the first law of thermodynamics is also considered as the law of conservation of energy because this law is similar similar with the law of conservation of energy you said that energy can neither be created nor destroyed although it can be transformed from one form to another so that means that means the the energy can never be created and it cannot be destroyed but it can only transform or change from one form to another how is this how how is this possible first the primary source of energy the primary source of energy is sun so when we actually when we when plant absorb the sunlight, it will convert the solar energy into chemical energy in the forms of storage energy. That is chemical energy. And when we human we check that form of energy, or we check like uh maize, rice, beans, or whatsoever it is, the internal the energy is already there in the form of chemical energy. And now when we take it and we eat it, then we'll now convert that chemical energy into mechanical energy. And that mechanical energy can also easily be converted into heat energy, which we actually, we release. We release because the waste form of energy in human system is in the form of heat energy. So that heat energy will also consume by other organism and use it as another source of energy. So that is why we need to understand that the energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only change from one form to another. Look at how it changed from solar energy, to chemical energy, mechanical energy, as well as heat energy. So this is how, how, how energy is being utilized. For example, now in a fireflies, in a fireflies, you, the fireflies can easily combat chemical energy into light energy because fireflies usually produce light in the night. So or in the other terms, we can now say that this law of the, the, the law of thermodynamics state that the total amount of energy of the universe is a constant, is a constant, is constant, is to remain the way it is. It neither be created or destroyed. So it remains constant. It remains constant. Okay. So this is actually under this first law of uh, thermodynamics. We have heat transfer. Of course, heat can be transferred from one position or from one point to another. And we have E as an internal energy. So we have state one and state two. So state one, we can consider state one as our initial energy and state two as our final internal energy. So we have a work done. So when we have E2 is equal to E1 plus QW, 
Q means quantity of heat, W means work done. So therefore we have a formula for uh, for this first law of thermodynamics as E is equal to Q plus W. Q stand for quantity of heat. Q stand for quantity, it stands for quantity of heat. It is a quantity of heat. While W stand for work done, it's work done, it is work done. And then the E stand for internal uh, energy, okay? So this is how we have E1 is equal to, uh, okay, E2 is equal to E1 plus Q plus W. So the change in internal energy is equal to E2 minus E1 is equal to Q plus W. So now we have change in internal energy, which is delta E is equal to Q plus W. So if work is done by the system, if it is the system that does, that's, that does the work, if it is a system that does the work, then the change in internal energy is equal to Q minus W because the system is done, sorry, the work is done by the system. But if the work is done by the surrounding, then, or if the work is done on the system, not by the system, that the W usually change as positive. So that is why now let's look at these different conditions. Or oh, yeah, the frame, this different one. We have plus Q, W, so we can have plus Q, that is positive quantity of heat when heat absorbed by the system. So if the system absorbs the heat, then we have plus W. But if heat is liberated by the system, if it's the system that releases the heat outside, then it's now minus. And if it is work done, if there is a work done on the system, if the work is on the system, then we have plus W. And if the work is done by the system, we have minus W. So we should understand this. The work done on the system is always plus W. The work done by the system, if is the if the system, if the system is the one that does the work, then it's negative. Is if the work done is done on the system, if the work done, like for example, if it is the surrounding that did the work on the system, then we have plus Q. Sorry, plus W. So please, we should understand these different cases. It's important. So now we are going to look at the enthalpy, entropy, and the change in enthalpy. What is enthalpy? Enthalpy is the amount of heat stored in the system under particular condition, and it's termed as a heat content of the system. So the enthalpy means is the amount of heat, the amount of heat of the system. Like for example, if you now take a cup and you measure the amount of heat that is in that cup. It means that you measure the enthalpy. So the amount of heat that are stored in the system is what you call enthalpy. And this enthalpy is represented with capital letter H. And this capital letter H is equal to E plus P W. P stands for fragile, V is W. So you can also have change in enthalpy. The change in enthalpy is delta H is equal to H2 minus H1. On constant P, on constant, on constant P, sorry, on, on constant P, HP, EP, and equals to an DP. So we are representing, we, we will actually have PPP attached to all this. So if heat absorbed by the system on constant P, then we have HR, ER, and WR. So therefore at the end, the change in enthalpy, the change in enthalpy is going to be, if you now subtract equation, equation, equation B, or if you subtract equation B by A, then we now end up of having delta H is equal to delta E plus P delta W. Delta H is change in enthalpy, delta E is change in internal energy, and P stands for fragile, delta V stands for change in volume. So we should understand this, the relationship between enthalpy and enthalpy change.
So now we are going to look at the specific heat capacity of a substance. So what is a specific heat capacity? A specific heat capacity of a substance is the quantity of heat supplied per unit mass per unit raised in temperature. So when we say specific heat capacity, it means that it's a quantity of heat that is needed to raise the temperature of a substance by one degree centigrade. Yes, so that is the specific heat capacity, is the amount of heat that is required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree centigrade. And this specific heat capacity is donated by delta Q. Delta Q here stands for change of quantity of heat. M stands for mass of the substance. C stands for specific heat capacity of a substance. And delta T here means change in temperature. Change in temperature, which can be theta 2. It can be theta 2 minus theta 1. Theta 2 minus theta 1 or T2 minus theta 1 is this. Then we can now make C subject of the formula. And how are we going to make this C subject of the formula? It's simple. We are now going to say the bite both side by M delta T. Now, so we now said M divided by M delta T. Here we also said M delta T. We divide it as M delta T. So therefore, this one will now cancel this, and this one will now cancel this. So therefore, we now have C is equal to delta Q. We have delta Q all over M delta T. So we have this. So C is equal to delta Q all over M delta T. So that is how we arrive at this, where C stands for specific capacity. So the specific capacity at constant pressure, the specific capacity at constant pressure is given by CP means specific capacity at constant pressure. Then we have delta Q all over delta T as this. Then the specific capacity at constant pressure is it, uh, the, the specific capacity at constant volume. At constant volume is now equals to CV delta Q all over delta T V. So the relationship between specific capacity at constant pressure CP and Specific capacity at constant volume CV is given by Myers relation. The Myers relationship is just CP minus CV is equal to R. So this is the formula that actually gives the relationship between specific capacity at constant pressure and constant volume. It's just CP minus CV, while R stands for universal gas constant. And note that you should know that Specific capacity at constant pressure is greater than specific capacity at constant volume. So the limitation of the first law of thermodynamics is that it neither puts restriction on the direction of flow of heat, no space, no spe, no specific, no spe, no specific divisibility of the reaction. So the first law of thermodynamics actually do not talk about the direction of the heat and also whether the reactions are feasible or not. It's just only talking about the, 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 the energy, the energy, the energy content of the system or of the universe that it can never be created, nor destroy it. So we should all know this. It is very, very important. So I think in this slide, we talk about the specific capacity where we said that specific capacity is the amount of heat that is required to raise the temperature of, uh, of, 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 of one gram of a substance by one degree centigrade, by one degree centigrade. And the limitation of this first law of thermodynamics is that it doesn't actually talk about the direction of flow of heat and neither also talk about the, the, the feasibility of the reaction.
okay so now we are going to look, talk about the thermodynamic process so a thermodynamic process we are starting with a system is said to undergo thermodynamic process when there is change in energy within the system generally associated with changes in radio, volume, temperature, and internal energy, or any other form of heat transfer. So therefore, in a thermodynamic process, whenever we want to talk about the thermodynamic process, we actually have to look at it at a point where there must be an inch, where there must be a change in energy, in relationship or in association with radio, volume, temperature, and internal energy. So we have to talk about that. Like for example, in the adiabatic process, in this system, there is no heat transfer into or out of the system. So the change in quantity of heat is zero. So you see, since there is no exchange of heat between the system and the surrounding, there is no heat transfer. So therefore there is no energy change. So therefore as a result of that, the change in quantity of heat is equal to zero. So when a system expands adiabatically, that is then when then the value is positive and U decreases. Thus, we have U2 minus U1 is equal to minus the value. So when a system is compressed, so you see here, we are talking about the compression and the expansion. So in the case of expansion, W is negative. And in the case of compression, W is positive. So the equation of a diabetic process is given by, so the relationship between prejo and volume, that is Poisson's law, we have PB raised to the power of gamma is equal to constant. So that is the relationship between fragile and volume under a diabetic condition. And then the relationship between temperature and volume. So remember, since we have P, so from this equation, from the general gas equation, remember we have V, V is equal to NRT, is equal to NRT. So in this case, because here we have radio, so how can we now make radio subject of the formula? So we can now say divide both sides by V. Divide both sides by V. So therefore, this V will now cancel this. So at the end, we have radio. We have radio is equal to N R T divided by V. So therefore, we can now just substitute you can now just substitute this P and just place it with RT all over V. Here is number of moles. So assuming that the number of moles is one. So that is why from here, from P, from CV, rest to the power of gamma is equal to constant. It's equal to constant. So what we are going to do now, we already get our P as this. So we are now going to set N R T divided by V, then we already have B here. So times B raised to the power of gamma, then is equal to constant. It's equal to constant. So therefore, in this case, in this case, the, assuming now the number of moles is one. So that is why we have this. We have this. And then the next thing is, the relationship between temperature and fridge or under this adiabatic condition. So under this adiabatic condition, we have PP, we have PP as this, TP as the power of one minus gamma divided by gamma is equal to constant, is equal to constant. So we have this. And therefore, what is the relationship between CP and CB under a derivative condition? Of course, gamma is equal to CP all over 
CV. So I think I, I, I will advise you, if you are reading this course, to try as much as possible to understand these conditions under a diabetic process, under under a diabetic process, under isothermal process, under isochoric process, and isobaric process. So you should understand that. So at this point, we have this. Okay, so now we are going to have another set of video. Thank you. Make sure you subscribe.